We're excited to announce that our very own podcasting platform, Zencaster, has become a new sponsor to the show. Check out the podcast discount link in our show notes and stay tuned for why we love using Zen for the podcast. You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. This is the CRM Archaeology Podcast. It's the show where we pull back the veil of cultural resources management, archaeology, and discuss the issues that everyone is concerned about. Welcome to the podcast. Hello and welcome to the CRM Archaeology Podcast, episode 215 for May 19th, 2021. I'm your host, Chris Webster. On today's show, we talk about the systems and processes that we have in place that help us get our projects done on time. So get your resume updated because you're about to be a project manager and because the CRM Archaeology Podcast starts right now. Welcome to the show, everyone. Joining me today is Stephen in Calgary. Hello. And also Ruckus in Calgary. <laughs> now he's not going to meow. There he is. <laughs> no, Wait, you, that sounded a little stressed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I poked him. <laughs> he poked him. <laughs> nice, nice. Longtime listeners of the show will recognize uh, Ruckus, our sometime co-host, although I was saying to Stephen before we started recording, I haven't heard from him in a little while, so it's good to hear Ruckus back on the show. Yeah, he, his uh, sleeping habit had been to uh, be taking naps during the show, so he hadn't, hadn't had much to say. But today you're all in for a treat because he woke up like five minutes ago, and uh, <laughs> he, he has a lot to say, yeah. most of it about the lack of service that he receives from me. Nice. All right, well, our topic today is basically how to organize and manage your day, right? And this might seem irrelevant if you are a field technician or if you are a crew chief or maybe even a brand new project manager. I don't know, right? It just depends on you, who you are and what your schedule is like. But there are typically for all levels of this field and really any job that you have, a lot of things that you have to keep track of throughout not only the day, but throughout you know the weeks and months that you're trying to help complete a project. Let's say even, you know, at the quote lowest level, not to disparage it at all, but at the lowest occupational level that we have within this field, which is field technician, even field technicians are like, you know, you've got a daily schedule that you have to keep. You got to look at your breaks, your lunch. You've got to look at, you know, how much is left uh, on the project, managing that information. You might be helping the crew chief figure out. We're, we're on a 10 day. So should we save some roads and stuff for the end of this 10 day to survey? Should we, you know, how do you, how do you manage that information so you can be the most efficient that you can be? Now, a lot of people don't care about being efficient and that's just a fact, <laughs> but this is probably more geared towards those people that do have to manage, if not single, but multiple projects and just the systems and tools in place to help us do that. What spawned this conversation for me is, again, we're, we're on this big road trip across the United States. My wife and I are from Massachusetts over to Nevada, and there's a lot of driving involved. So I kind of took a little break from podcasts, which is what I've been listening to for about the last, I don't know, 12, 13 years. And I decided to download some audiobooks, really some, you know, I don't want to say self-help, but some, I guess, self-help audiobooks, uh, more aligned around project management and leadership and stuff like that. And one of them was called the 5 a.m. club, so a concept I've heard of before. But this one was a weird kind of fictionalized way of presenting an idea. And by, by fictionalized, the the author, and we'll link to it in the show notes, but the author came up with these characters that he didn't even give names to. He just gave occupations to. And they basically went through this journey talking to this other guy who was successful, who was trying to impart knowledge. And it was this whole thing. But basically... It, it all sort of boiled down to doing this doing this thing at 5 a.m. that they call the 2020 plan, where you spend 20 minutes of doing like an intense workout. Like you literally wake up at like 4.40, 4.45, whatever time you need to get ready. And at 5 a.m., you're doing some sort of physical aerobic activity, not like weightlifting or anything like that, but physical aer aerobic activity. There's a bunch of stuff they mentioned that whether you believe it or not has to do with chemical release and endorphins and things like that. And then you go straight into 20 minutes of what they suggest is either journaling or meditation or something like that, just getting thoughts down or clearing your mind. And then 20 minutes of learning something. And I've been doing 
Spanish on Duolingo as my 20 minutes. I kind of picked that up. I started it last summer, but then did it for a few months and kind of let it go for a little while. Now I picked that up again, but probably switched to something else here uh, in a little bit. But it's basically the 2020 program, 2020, 20. 20, 20, 20. There's three 20s because <laughs> it's an hour. But basically, it's it's this whole frame of mind about starting your day the right way. You know what I mean? There's a lot of people who just wake up and head straight out the door, straight to work. You know, and I, I can't deny that I haven't probably done that once or twice in my field tech career where you just wake up and you just can't get out of bed. It's just been a long field season or something like that. And you basically throw in your clothes, grab your lunch and you walk out the door to the field vehicle. And then you take another 30 minute nap on your way to wherever you're going or longer. Right. We've all probably done that at some point in our lives, but it doesn't really set the tone for the rest of the day for most people. Most people that have to get a lot of stuff done. So I'll pause right there. That's that's what basically spawned this whole thing. And I, and I wanted to talk about how, you know, those of us that could, could make the show, which is Stephen and I, you know what we do, because Stephen, you were a project manager. I mean, your position's a little bit different now. Maybe we can talk about that. But definitely when you were in Wisconsin, I mean, you were a project manager for a long time, you know, for us, for a company over there. And you must have had some ways that you kept yourself on track and organized. So let's have a chat about that. Yes. Yes. What, what did I do? Uh, <laughs> that's, that's been a few years. Let's fast forward um, to what I'm doing now, where okay. I'm a project archaeologist and, and I do run, I hold my own permits and I run projects. And it's basically, it's the Alberta equivalent of being a uh, principal investigator. Um, okay. It, except that there are, there's a requirement that you have to be on site a certain percentage of the time. I can't remember if it's like 75 or 80 percent, but um, you, you are expected to be there in the field. So the absentee principal investigator isn't really a thing up here. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I have to track multiple projects and okay, yeah, and, and um, stay organized and, as well as I do a lot of support stuff for other people's projects. I, I do a lot of the GIS work. I maintain the artifact uh, cataloging database I, I do some uh, data crunching with various R scripts. Mm -hmm. So th there's a lot of me just kind of running around trying to get everybody's stuff done. That's really the the crux of what the books I've been listening to. I've, been, I've listened to like four books on this trip so far. Uh, these these kinds of books, they tend to be a little bit shorter and I listen to them at 2x. So they take like three hours, which is pretty great. That, that's kind of the crux of it, right? Because a lot of people in their jobs, what, regardless of the complexity of their jobs, they get pulled in different directions a lot, right? And, and we all know mm -hmm. that multitasking is really hard. And it's been proven time and time again that humans do not multitask very well. And so, so finding, getting your attention on one thing and then having that attention broken and then bringing that attention back to that one thing, there's actually a little bit of a lag there for a lot of people, depending on how hard your attention was pulled. There's what this one guy called attention residue that happens where you're basically just still kind of thinking about the thing that just pulled you away, depending on again, how long and complex it was, but you're still kind of thinking about it and it's destroying a little bit of your productivity, getting the swing of back into your thing. So that's what I'm kind of wondering, though, with all of your responsibilities as a project archaeologist, do you set up strict boundaries for things that you want to do? Do you ever go into like so-called deep work periods where you're just shutting off social media, email, your phone, and you're like, I got to crunch this thing out and get it done. And everybody else is just going to kind of have to wait. Or are you able to flex and move as the needs arise? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, um, well, I, I mean, for social media, I, I basically... I, I have a work mode on my phone that only mm -hmm. allows certain uh, certain apps. Yeah, and and uh, basically I go straight into that. Yeah, and then like I, I'm also a big fan of like uh, like Pomodoro uh, timers. Mm -hmm. You know, like the 20 minutes, and then like you get a five minute break, stand up, you know, go get some water, look out the window, whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe maybe then I'll unlock my phone and, and check social media, but not usually. Yeah. And then, uh, and, and that's why I never respond to anybody on Twitter these days because uh, <laughs> I'm on Twitter for like all of five minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so as, as far as social media and stuff goes, um, you know, I basically shut it out right away because it will, you know, that will be very distractive. Yeah. And then as, as far as like the deluge of tasks that, you know, pop that end up on my to-do list, 
I, what what I what I find is yeah, like like you say, like jumping back and forth between things is terrible. Mm-hmm. And and you know, not not even the residual thing, but I, I I have a lot of trouble trying to remember what like where did I leave off on this? Um, if <laughs> if it's something that's like in progress, like so if if it's not something I can do in one complete block, then you know, like like you come back the next day and it's like oh. Did I yeah. do that part? I thought I did that part, but I should probably <laughs> check in whether I did that part. Um, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sure you deal with the same thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So generally, the, the way I do it is I try to, with varying degrees of success, I find that it works better if I can compartmentalize my time. Right. So I try to do big blocks with as few things as possible. So like, if I'm like, okay... I have these five maps for various different projects that I have to do on the GIS. I will set aside time that's GIS time. And then I've got like a to-do list and I will go over there and I will just work my way through that list. And then um, after that, when that list is done, the next block will be me working on like one of my projects, like maybe I have to go back and start working on a report or a desktop study or something. And, and it's like, okay, well, I'm going to get an hour, at least an hour mm-hmm. on that. So I'll jump over, you know, and, and, and work on that. And if something comes in, unless it's super smoking, like, you know, we need, we needed this uh, yesterday and, <laughs> and uh, it didn't get done. So can you knock yeah. it out? You know, like any new requests are going to go into the queue for basically the next block. And yeah. I'm still kind of playing with this. This this is something I came up with this spring while I was still working from home um, from COVID. And I, I feel like I'm there's a certain amount of flexibility in there and how long those blocks have to be. And, and I haven't like fully dialed it into like a, a, like an optimized time frame. You know, like do I tie mm-hmm. it to like the Pomodoro 20 minutes or do I, you know, give it an hour or – you know, or, or do I just kind of go with the flow? Like, how's my concentration? Like, if, sure. if I can sit there for an hour and knock shit out, then um, maybe, maybe that's good enough. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I feel like that's, yeah. that's pretty much how I, how I organize it now. And, th- and then ki- ki- kind of in the background, and I haven't really talked about this at all. Like, I, I tend to work kind of off uh, like to-do lists that are kind of structured a lot like the bullet journal system where um, Mm -hmm. there are different uh, topics and then like you can migrate it to the next day for things that didn't get finished or things that need to be followed up. And then I add in like uh, conditional type stuff. So like if, if something's, if I'm working on a report, but I'm waiting for like a data search from um, like a record search to, to get sent to me, then I can't work on it. Well, you know, until I get that data, then, you know, that that goes into the to-do list, you know, as, as like a subheading. And it's kind of like a bullet, like a bullet list, basically, uh, with, yeah. you know, sub- subheadings and, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I try to do that at the beginning of the day, like when I'm in the office, you know, like I, I will do that in a daily planner that I have. Uh, I use the Hobonichi Techo system, but like really anything would work. Mm-hmm. And, and part of it is, in, in my mind, the process of rewriting the to-do list, even if it's going to be essentially the same thing as the previous day. <laughs> that makes me think about it again. Yeah. Like, what do I need to work on? What are the priorities? And and sometimes the priority, like, even if like, it's the same five things as the, what was on yesterday that for some reason didn't get done. Maybe the priorities are different today than they were yesterday. Yeah. Um. So it might get reorganized. And then the, the other thing I uh, like about the Honichi is it has like a timeline on the side side of the page, mm-hmm. which is basically for scheduling, right? For the day's schedule. I actually use that to track my hours to put it into our uh, timekeeping system. So I know what okay. I actually worked on, right? Like, <laughs> and, and then at, at some point, like I can, like if, if it, it's like, I'm sure I worked on that last week, you know, I can flip through and see what I actually worked on versus sure. what I planned on working. That's basically what I, the way I'm working right now. Yeah. And, and it's always in flux. Like I'm always trying different things. I'm always looking at what people are doing. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, let's go ahead and take a break on that note because Heather has joined us and I want to bring her in officially and, you know, sync up all the audio, file, audio files in a nice way for the editors. <laughs> so, which is probably me, but 
Let's go ahead and take a break and come back on the other side and keep talking about this back in a second. Chris Webster here for the Archaeology Podcast Network. We strive for high quality interviews and content so you can find information on any topic in archaeology from around the world. One way we do that is by recording interviews with our hosts and guests located in many parts of the world all at once. We do that through the use of Zencaster. That's Z-E-N-C-A-S-T-R. Zencaster allows us to record high quality audio with no stress on the guest. Just send them a link to click on and that's it. Zencaster does the rest. They even do automatic transcriptions. Check out the link in the show notes for 30% off your first three months or go to Z-E-N-C-A-S-T-R.com and use the code CRMARC. Looking to expand your knowledge of x-rays and imaging in the archaeology field? Then check out An Introduction to Paleo Radiography, a short online course offering professional training for archaeologists and affiliated disciplines. Created by archaeologist, radiographer, and lecturer James Elliott, the content of this course is based upon his research and teaching experience in higher education. It is approved by the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists as four hours of training. That's in the UK, for those of you that don't know. So don't miss out on this exciting opportunity for professional and personal development. For more information on pricing, and course structure, visit paleoimaging.com. That's P-A-L-E-O imaging.com. And look for the link in the show notes to this episode. Welcome back to episode 215 of the CRM Archaeology Podcast. And we are talking about essentially organizing and managing your day. And Stephen, you just had a great rundown of what a day looks like for you. And I'm glad to hear, because I was going to ask about this if anybody does this, but I'm glad to hear you have like, you know, you do have like focused periods for the, for the most part. And then, you know, for maybe some other tasks, you're using that Pomodoro method, which I actually have an app on my Apple watch that, you know, you just tap it basically right on the main screen there. You don't even have to start it. It's one of the complications they call it, which is one of the little things on the dial. And you just tap it and you get into your 20 minute period, five minute break, 20 minute period, five minute break. And then I think it's 20 minute period and then like a 15 minute break or something like that. But you can actually tweak that to, to however you want. Now, for me, that actually works for shorter term things that I'm doing. Like if I have a two hour block of time where I need to get all my emails done or I need to, you know, get all my emails and then do some one of the companies I work for, we have to update clients in Salesforce. I always forget to do that like in the moment. And so I'll just kind of backtrack and I'll have a chunk of time <laughs> where that's what I'm doing is I'm updating my client notes in Salesforce and I'm checking my emails and I'm keeping on top of that. But if you just try to do it for like two hours straight, you just go nuts, right? You just start you start to lose focus. And because email is one of those weird things that like each email pulls you out of the, the thing you were doing because it's like a new task is answering a new email. Okay, what's this person's problem? What, what do I have to solve here? What am I trying to do? What kind of answer do they need? Stuff like that. So I've been working real hard to kind of craft my day. Now this two weeks, that period that I'm in right now is a little bit different than what I normally do. I've had to take a lot of my morning time and change it to travel time as we're heading back to Nevada here. But normally I've got it spread out a little more, but you know, like it's really hard to stay focused. And one of the ways that I kind of keep up on that is I take good notes. Like you were saying, Stephen, sometimes it's hard when you get pulled out of something or maybe you come back the next day, you just got pulled out by the end of the day. And you're like, what the heck was I doing? Did I, did I keep up on that? That certainly happens to me too, but I try to keep really good notes about the client that I talked to, what, what we were doing. Cause let me give you a, an example of my tomorrow, which is Monday. I've got a client meeting from nine to 11 internal from 11 to 12, a uh, client meeting from 12 to two internal from two to three. And then I scheduled an hour for basically a retrospective on my first two client meetings. So I can keep notes up for an hour. And then I've got another internal meeting from four to five and then another meeting at five thirty. <laughs> so that's like, solid. There's no breaks in there. Uh, a lot of times calls will end a little bit early um, because everybody likes breaks. So that's how I kind of manage that. But it gets real hard to stay focused and switch from client to client to client to client when you're, you know, everybody's a little bit the same in this business that I'm doing right now, but they're all slightly different too. So if I didn't have my notes to go back to and really you know, see what we talked about last time, then I would get completely confused. We'd spend the first 20 minutes just catching up, trying to figure out where we're at because they certainly don't keep any notes. They just kind of rely on me to do that. So that's interesting. I just wanted to say that as a rebuttal to what, uh, to what you said, but I also want to bring in Heather. Heather joined us halfway through the last segment. Heather, how's it going? I'm good. (laughs) I love this (laughs) topic because I I think it's a constantly evolving for for anybody who's in this business or actually any business really. But I mean, sure. 
the the further up the ladder you climb or the more responsibilities you have, the more important time management is. It's it's mm-hmm. such an important skill to have. Yeah. So you work for a decently sized company. You're probably managing mm-hmm. multiple projects at one time. You you hold yeah. a, you know, a high position at that company. Do you, I mean, aside from like a calendar, which I don't know how people can work without a calendar and people at yeah. our level, not to sound egotistical about it, but people at our level, people that are managing multiple things, you have to have a calendar. You have to have yes. all of your appointments down. You, you, and sometimes... I mean, I have lunch scheduled on my calendar half the time. Like if I if I have time for it, I mean, I'll uh, if I look at my day and there's any holes, usually in the morning, I'll I'll fill in the holes that are in my calendar because the way my schedule works is people actually book time on my calendar a lot of the time. I have regularly scheduled mm-hmm. client meetings every week, but people will book time on my calendar. So I'll look at the sometimes I'll look at the beginning of the week and I'll go fill in some spaces so they can't book and I just get time to myself to just get some work done. And sometimes I'll look in the morning and do the same thing and I'll just fill those holes in myself so nobody can schedule over the top of those. But other than a calendar, is there anything that you do or any process or just way that you think about your work that helps you just know where you're at? Because you probably have projects in multiple you know, states, like maybe mm-hmm. you just got a new contract, you've got mm-hmm. one that field work's getting done on, and you've got one you're working on final draft comments for, you know what I mean? And that's right. simultaneous. So I supervise our LA Pasadena office, mm-hmm. as well as running the Central Coast office. And so you can imagine, yeah, there's a lot of projects. In fact, so we do time and materials. So we bill our time per 25 minute or uh, 15 minute increments. So quarter of an hour mm-hmm. increments. In the beginning, that was a little, you know, when you start off, you're just trying to fill the time. Now I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to build to and what I'm not going to build to because I'm salaried. So <laughs> there, <laughs> I just, I have so, there's so much work. So, you know, I was talking to a colleague and my timesheet a couple of weeks ago actually had 40 entries. That means 40 Jeez. separate projects that I touched wow. over the week. And yeah. it's it just keeps getting worse. I was telling my team, I thought, I said, you know what? I have, and I'm not a big video game person, but mm-hmm. I said, it feels like, and I'll show my age, but it feels like like Mario Brothers where I'm, <laughs> you know, running, 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 running. And then, you know, you get all that adrenaline pumping and you get to the finish line and you're like, whew. And then you realize I succeeded. Now I'm leveling up. Oh, my goodness. And that's what it feels like. Mm -hmm. Every week, we're leveling up to a harder level. (laughs) That's what it feels (laughs) like. And I mean, that's a great problem to have. It's called job security. So I'm not complaining. Mm -hmm. But that's why for me, project management is always evolving. And, you know, I do a team meeting every week where we sit down and we try to figure out what's working and what's not working and how can we improve and how is it being seen from other people. So I think for me, in a daily minute, the biggest trick, and it's the easy trick, but for me, I'm getting easily 150 emails a day, easily. So mm-hmm. I, and, and a lot of them are threads of the same subject, right? But, and everybody's situation is an emergency, <laughs> in their mind. And it needs to be answered. And this is the only project, of course, that Heather has on her desk. So (laughs) um, responsiveness, but it is responsiveness is so important in this business. Mm -hmm. We deal with, you know, CRM professionals deal with, you know, developers, large companies that expect very customized, very high-end customer service. I mean, they expect your full attention. And the best way to communicate that is through responsiveness and and very quick responsiveness, not just responding, but responding within the hour. (laughs) I mean, that is, I I try to do it within 20 minutes if I can, and, and even quicker than that. And so in order to do that, obviously it's pulling your mind. I mean, I still writing reports, I'm still doing senior review. I'm still, you know, I have lots of other tasks. And so for me, I have a notebook that I literally sometimes just blindly write in and I just write it down, write it down, write it down. Because otherwise in my head, I'm either going to forget it or I'm going to be completely sidetracked. And so in order for me to, I I purge it basically. Mm -hmm. So as soon as I write it down, my mind calms itself and I realize, okay, I'm not going to forget this because I just wrote it down. And then I can keep going on the task that I have and then go back to that task. And so you're constant, you get better at it over time where you're categorizing, 
constantly and prioritizing constantly. So you have this list in your head that is like, it's, it's not a to do for me. When I started, it was a to do list. I had this to do list and it was static. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to do this. (laughs) And now we, you know, the, the more responsibility you have, the less, the less luxury you have of having a static priority list. Yeah. For me, it's dynamic. It's constantly shifting back and forth. And so I think in overall, in the daily is notes on the fly are really important. And then we have an Excel sheet, which is a share on share file. And we do, it's scheduling. So as soon as we have it set up with, you know, columns, so that are generalized to what is expected for each project. And we have different sheets for different types of projects, whether it be a monitoring project or a excavation project or just a survey or just a desktop review, those kinds of things. So the columns are based on what you would typically do for that project. And as people are accomplishing, then they are putting those things in to the done. You know, it's just a simple sheet. That is really important because so much time is lost in email in did you has this been done has that been done well you can just go right to that sheet and see that it's done now we didn't yeah. buy we don't have any any kind of special program it's a simple excel sheet but it works and then i think the other major thing i mean i can i i have a very specific weekly schedule that i have to accomplish in order to really be successful in that week and i can go over that mm-hmm. later but the The other thing that in a general sense is training up, training up your staff so that they can take on responsibilities that, you know, the more that you can delegate, the better it is. And it's not about pushing the responsibility off. No, first of all, you're growing them as professionals. And second, it's a lot more efficient. There's no reason I should be doing a record search write up because now a majority of the report, by the time it comes to me, the report is done. We've automized and automation to me is really important. And mm-hmm. I know it goes back to the, you know, the conversation we had a couple of weeks ago about boilerplate. And I do think, you know, boilerplate is good when it comes to keeping things consistent. There are certain things like the regulatory language, how you approach a record search write up. These are very, Mm -hmm. very important to me to having consistency and to making sure that everything that's covered is everything that needs to be covered is covered. And so I, we have templates and that guide people on how to write certain aspects of the report, which I've developed over time and they evolve, they change. We better them as laws change or as we learn, you know what, that you're a client will ask it it very (laughs) innocently say, you know, I'm not quite sure I understand this. And you're like, you know what? I I understand it because I've been in the business forever, but you're right. That I, I don't know. If I wasn't, <laughs> I wouldn't understand it either. And then we change our templates based on that. But I think automizing uh, the approach is really important so that the most important part can be, can have that customized approach where you're really analyzing. So you're creating your narrative through the report and then you're focusing on the analysis on the conclusion mm-hmm. and on the recommendations. And so for me, training up people to do all the automized portions of the report is so important to the time yeah. time management. Yeah, agreed. And uh, a quick note on the emails, the email problem, right? You know, a yeah. lot of times you're answering emails from, you know, clients, agencies, whatever the case may be. But more often than not, you're also answering emails from internal conversations. Yes. And mm-hmm. I'll tell you what, th- one of the companies I work with uh, pretty consistently, we have Teams, so the the Microsoft Teams, we have mm-hmm. Slack, yep. we have Outlook, and still I'll get an email that says, hey, are you free today for a couple hours or something like that? I even have a calendar scheduler like right in my yeah. signature uh, on my thing. I'm like, do not send me that email. Like that is a ridiculous email because <laughs> A, I'm not going to respond to it. Yeah. I'm going to hit you up on Teams where that conversation right. should belong. Yes, and yes, and yes. let's go from there because I, I save every email that I get, right? I put it into a folder and it takes me, me too. Yep. 
I mean, a- Apple Mail is pretty good about saying, hey, you usually put this email from this person in this folder. So here's one button you can click on and it's smart and it allows you to do that. So that's okay. But man, when somebody tries to have a conversation through me through email and it really is that a conversation back and forth. Crazy. Oh, my God. Yeah. That drives so me crazy. I, for us, it's Zoom. Zoom and Zoom is oh, yeah. so great because for me, I'm old fashioned. My kids laugh at me because I just, I write texts <laughs> like I email <laughs> mm-hmm. and I email like I wrote a letter when I was a kid. <laughs> um, <laughs> right, it's right. A, hi, a salutation in the beginning, a you know formal way of writ- writing. I don't do like half sentences. That's just not me. But in Zoom, mm-hmm. I can. You know, and I still do yeah. it if I haven't talked to the person over the day. I will I will do a salutation to begin with. Because that's just who I am, I guess, as the Midwesterner no. in me. But do you mean do you mean Skype? <laughs> Zoom instead of Zoom. Uh, no, Zoom. Like, you guys no, do like text in- chatting through Zoom. Yes. Yeah, that's wow. our primary okay. communication method. Wow. Yeah, it's it's great. I love it. We have a bunch of channels, so I have all these mm-hmm. you know channels. The people that I talk to the most are the ones that are you know Zoom automatically puts them up to the top. That's so important. We are, we're on there all the time. Then what's nice is we can just do a meeting and sometimes we're writing a, we're writing something or they need, you know, so, somebody needs some direction. We'll be working together in the do- share document mm-hmm. and on Zoom at the same time. So we're talking and we're, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to do, and it yeah. doesn't happen all the time, but it, it helps, especially when training people, but it is you know, especially this last year has been, it's just gone, you know, gangbusters with work, uh, I think for everyone. And so Mm -hmm. for me, you know, we've had some really big projects we've had to wrap around our head around with multiple project sites that it was really important to have that consistent approach. And so that's where some more templates were created. And I, I just am so like, I wish I had done it a long time ago because uh, we did it a couple of years ago, but I'm so glad that we did it because it has really tightened up. I, I like for me, I like it when I open up a report and I know that this person has written the report. I know where I'm going to find everything. I know that mm-hmm. if I'm reading, let's say, a site record summary, if they don't mention something in there because of the, if, if it's organized a certain way, it's because it it's, was not forgotten. It sure. didn't happen. You're right. And the site record didn't include it. Yeah. You know, these are these are all really good tools, right, that people can use. And I think one thing we're finding out after listening to Stephen in segment one and yourself here in segment two, that there's no one solution that works for everybody. Right. It's a suite of tools that works for your brain and allow you to you know, do your work. And and however that makes you get things done, if you go home at the end of the day and you feel like you got things accomplished and hopefully you're not thinking too much about work in the evening. I mean, I know people do, but hopefully you're not thinking too much about it. And maybe on the weekend you have time to unwind. Then I'd say you've probably achieved your goal of staying organized and getting things done. But if you're constantly worrying about it, then you probably need a little bit more work, to be honest. Or you're just overworked, right? Your company needs mm-hmm. to hire more people to, yes. to you know, sh- <laughs> to have some of that load. So let's take a break and come back and wrap this up on the other side with some tools you can actually use right now. You may have heard my pitch for membership. It's a great idea and really helps out. However, you can also support us by picking up a fun t-shirt, sticker, or something from a large selection of items from our T Public store. Head over to arcpodnet.com slash shop for a link. That's arcpodnet.com slash shop to pick up some fun swag and support the show. All right, welcome back to the Sierra Mark Podcast, episode 215. And we're talking about staying organized and I want to use this last segment because to be honest, we could talk about this for hours. I mean, I've listened to several books in the last few days on this crazy drive that we're doing where the entire book was talking about just organizing yourself for a portion of the day, right? In, in one different way. The two books that, that really stick out to me that I'm going to link to in the show notes. Uh, one I mentioned at the beginning called the 5 a.m. club. And that really is all about getting yourself in the right frame of mind for the day and and looking at how your day is going to look and starting early doing that. You can you can discuss the merits of why that should be at 5 a.m. till you're blue in the face, because for some people, 5 a.m. is 8 a.m. For some people, 5 a.m. is 3 a.m. I don't know, but it works. It's 
<laughs> my wife's giving me a thumbs down right now. She does not do 5 a.m. But uh, <laughs> it works for people who have a, I want to say a more traditional schedule where you've got like an eight to five or a nine to five office job or something like that. 5 a.m. is that time where typically the kids aren't awake yet. You know, maybe your spouse mm-hmm. isn't awake yet. You have that time to yourself to organize and get your day going properly. And that's yeah. kind of what that's all about. But you modify this to fit your own needs, right? Maybe their 2020-20 thing that I mentioned in the beginning is not 20-20-20 minutes. It, maybe it's 30-30-30. Maybe you've got, you know, more time and you just want to devote more time to it. It doesn't matter. It's all suggestive, right? But it's it's giving you a framework for getting the day going. The other mm-hmm. one that I'm currently listening to and I haven't finished is called Deep Work. And that's all about the science of deep work cycles and and really like true deep work, not just putting your headphones on and saying, I'm going to work on this task for the next two hours, but literally shutting things off and making sure that people know that they can't contact you and saying, listen, I got... I've got a two hour block that I'm setting aside or even like a four hour or five hour block that I'm setting aside to get this one thing done. I got to bring up a real quick example. This one guy in the book, I don't know who he was, but he, he knows the author and he got this thing where he's, he just all of a sudden he, he got a thing from a publisher or something like that, where he had to write basically a book. He had, he needed a first draft of a manuscript and it has to be done within the next two weeks. <laughs> and oh he got a pretty good advance death. for this. Yeah. I don't know the details of this. That sounds all fishy yeah. to begin with, but basically he bought a round trip ticket to Tokyo from New York and it's a 13 or 15 hour flight or some crazy thing. He wrote all the way there took a nap in the airport in the lounge, had a cup of espresso and flew back. And in the time he flew there and flew back, he had the entire thing drafted. (laughs) So he just like, I feel like that's a really expensive (laughs) way of going about this. Uh, He he said it had a good advance. (laughs) Well, he said it costs like $4,000, but I get the impression that this is a high performer and he probably made hundreds of thousands of dollars on this writing. Right. Right. So that was, it's either that, or he was going to spend, you know, the next two weeks finding time and doing this and that and it just wasn't yeah. going to be a solid chunk of time to just get these thoughts out right yeah. so yeah. that's an, but, ex- but that's you an couldn't extreme just version. drive out into the countryside for <laughs> for, for a well, weekend Steven, or something I, I don't know. also also in this book was jk i know also in this book was jk yeah. rowling right she lives in scotland and or, or at least northern england or something i think she lives in scotland and when she was writing the last harry potter book she just like woke up one morning when she's trying to crank this thing out and she's trying to bring all this stuff together from the previous six or whatever books. And it's, it it requires like intense concentration to just keep all these things in your head, to write this one final thing, to wrap everything up. And she just couldn't do it. Like one day she woke up in the morning and her kids were being loud and her husband, blah, 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 all these things. So she went to this hotel in Edinburgh, which happens to be about a thousand dollars a day. It's literally a luxury hotel, but she wanted to be surrounded by the, old world, old worldness Mm. of it to get herself in the right frame of mind. And it worked so well for her for the day. She stayed there for several weeks finishing the manuscript. Now she made millions of dollars per book. So spending 20 grand on a hotel was actually really worth it for her because it was able to, she was able to get that manuscript done and then, you know, get it off. So I'm also morally offended that you would fly all the way to Tokyo (laughs) and and not actually see Tokyo. And not go like, there? Yeah, right. <laughs> like, I, I could see, like, okay, you know, I worked really hard on the flight over and then take, take a day nap, then, you know, one day of sightseeing, then flight back and, and get it done. But, like, I mean, like, wow. I, I guess you didn't have the time. Opportunity. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I guess. I, I don't know what to tell you, but uh, those are some extreme examples of the deep work philosophy. And, but, and, and we all can't afford to do that, right? We all can't afford to just go even get a hotel room, you know, for a little while and just work on something and do that. But, um, but that is, that is part of that philosophy. So anyway, in the uh, remaining time that we have, I want to, <laughs> yeah, I was, was going to say, that. you know, I, I think it's a really good example of compartmentalizing for sure. I mm-hmm. think it's a little different for those of, you know, CRM professionals because you are juggling so many things. It's not like yeah. you have to focus on one book and and you just need all the peripheral sure. items of life to get to to just settle down and go away for a while. We are dealing with other work or other, you know, we have multiple clients that expect responsiveness and so we still I think for us the main at least for me, the most challenging aspect 
is like, it feels like you're in a batting cage, right? And you're trying to catch and you have one of those automated ball things, <laughs> mm-hmm. trying to catch all these yeah. balls and, and put them in the right, you know, category or whatever it deal with them, not just catch them, but deal with them. And, and so it's not enough for me. I actually do better the busier I am. So yeah. the more intense it becomes and the, the more my adrenaline starts pumping, the, the more I can handle things. We laugh about it. My colleagues and I, you know, and I'm sure everybody experiences this. You wake mm-hmm. up in the morning, you're like, we have a day in front of you. You're like, you know what? This is doable. I'm yeah. like really excited. I feel like I have the time to <laughs> really give it, you know, give it the attention it needs. And you're sitting and, and then five seconds later, you get an email and then another email and then another email and then another email. And you, I could, you know, I could start my Monday and have absolutely nothing on my plate to do, which never happens, but I could theoretically start my money, have absolutely nothing on my plate. And by 12 o'clock have more than I can handle. So do that on top of having projects that you clearly need to complete. It is, it's, you know, it's, it's definitely different to me than somebody who has to write a book, which is, I mean, that to me, that actually sometimes can be even more difficult because you have one thing you have to focus on. And, and all of this, of course, doesn't take your the rest of your life into account, right? Like we have yeah, other exactly. things that we're doing. I mean, I don't have any kids or anything, but I mean, a lot of people have, you know, kids that you're trying to manage. They have a spouse or partner or somebody that they, you know, mm-hmm. probably should spend time to time with from time to time. <laughs> and, <laughs> yes. and you've probably both got busy <laughs> schedules, right? And it's just yeah. trying to, you know, life is is uh, managing a project sometimes and, and just making sure... Right. Making sure it all stays on track. My team and I have conversations all the time about, is this really what I want to do? And especially people Mm -hmm. that are starting to come up in the business. And so we've talked about career pathing at my company. I'm part of developing the career pathing for our culture practice. And I really feel that there should be paths carved out for people who do not want to be project managers. And I think that that allows people to sit back and say, is this something I want to do? I think there are some personalities really conducive to it. I like having the hot potatoes, you know, all the time. I like that. (laughs) But not everybody likes that. And, you know, work isn't everything in life, right? So you need to figure out and and be honest with yourself and have an assessment of who you are and whether or not project management is, you know, what you want to do. And if that's the case, if it is, then you can, you know, really start focusing on developing those the skill sets that it takes to service the external and internal client (laughs) and you know which is really you know important to be able to juggle both they're both just as important so i think maybe the the approach to time management you know is different based on your position for sure right so that's really good and i i want to bring up now in the last probably six seven eight minutes here some actual tools that you guys use and and some tools that I use to keep all this straight. The first one I'll mention is Slack, right? We use Slack at the Archaeology Podcast Network. There's actually three different teams that we have. That's how Slack organizes things. We have one for the hosts and, you know, people involved with show production and stuff like that. We have a business team that's basically anyone involved that's basically not a host. Everybody else that's our volunteers, Tristan and I, Tristan's a co-founder, editors, anybody else that we have working behind the scenes to keep the APN going. We have our own team over there just to keep those channels focused. You know, the big reason we do that is because, I mean, there's probably... 20 plus channels in the host Slack team. And then there's uh, 20 plus channels in the business Slack team. And it's all just to keep your conversation focused and organized. And then there's channels that we have on a members only Slack team. So all the regular channels that we have for uh, all the different shows, then some extra stuff in our members only Slack. So it's a great way to communicate. One of the teams that I work with is actually in Australia. And a lot of times I'll, I'll get it. I'll wake up in the morning and I'll see stuff that they were talking about the night before. And a lot of times, you know, I'll leave messages because when I was on the East coast, I'm about to be on the West coast. So now it's going to get a little better for me getting closer to their work day, but their work day doesn't really start on West coast time until like two o'clock or so in the afternoon. They're in uh, the Western side of Australia or no, the Eastern side of Australia. And their work day doesn't start until about one, two o'clock my time. 
And so I'll leave some messages in there, but they're able to easily see those and then respond to them in real time or respond to them in a thread. So I can't speak highly enough about something like Slack. Even if you don't like Slack, you got to use something, right? Something that allows you to focus your conversation and uh, and keep those keep those channels in the in the places where they belong. And a lot of times we'll create channels just for certain clients and projects. Like this is all the discussion about this client, or maybe even we might have a big problem to solve and we'll just create a channel real quick to have a discussions about that channel right there. We do the same thing on teams. So, and and both of these are free, right? They have paid versions Mm -hmm. for, for enterprise level, but I've never paid for Slack and I'm on like 14 different teams. (laughs) So it's, you know, you can definitely use it. There's, there are a few limitations you probably won't even notice unless you get to that point, but you probably won't even notice them. And it's just a really good thing to use. But there's a number of messaging things out there. But I would definitely say, find something that takes those inane conversations out of email, right? But also takes them out of text messages, because you know what, you need the conversation to have a history. Because if you leave that company, or you, something happens to you, right, and you no longer work there, we sometimes need to go back and see those conversations. And so if they're in a place where they can be accessible like Slack or something like that, then that's where it needs to happen. If they're on text message history, that is the worst place they can possibly be. And then email is something that is recoverable if it's company email, but that's just the worst place to have a conversation is on email. So I agree. So I'm curious, Chris, you obviously you haven't used zoom in that way. So it sounds like it's rather you're using Slack the way I use Zoom. And I didn't even know you could do Zoom team channels and stuff like that. I yeah. thought you were talking about like Skype for business or something like that because... No, it's... Yeah, um, Zoom, I think it's... You know, it, I think that Zoom obviously wanted to have that one-stop shop sure, for companies. Sure. And so it must have integrated that later on. But yeah. for as long as we started using it, you know, right around the COVID, when COVID started, sure. it was first started with just staying in contact with people having some kind of hearing people's voices and (laughs) seeing people's faces. But the channels, I think, you know, it's one of the silver linings of COVID is that, you know, it definitely is uh, people have had to come up with different ideas, Mm -hmm. different ways of communicating with each other and and being um, more effective. And I am so, I love what you're saying about the email because, you know, there's some really, a few things that are irritating to me that I think is a good tool when it comes to time management and, and categorizing. And, for emails, number one, yes, get those those quick messages off of email, because for me, yeah. I like to know if an email comes across my, you know, comes up, uh, to me, it has a little bit more priority than the back and forth channel, you know, Zoom uh, conversations. Mm-hmm. And I can go back to them really quick, read them. If I, you know, missed them, I can just go down the chain and, and look where emails need to have a little bit more priority. And so being considerate of of your colleagues at work and not sending out emails number um, that that are just silly. And then on top of that, (laughs) don't copy everyone. I mean, come on. Oh, oh, that so irritates me. Oh, just reply all. No, it's really rude. Because now I feel like, you know, it's one of two things like I'm going to stop it. I'm going to start ignoring you. Okay, or you really it's really going to irritate me because I'm constantly yeah. looking at emails that I don't need to look at. And it, every mm-hmm. time I click and read an email, I have to read it <laughs> to see if it's important. So now you've taken away from my time. And yeah. then the other thing is, you know, putting in the subject memo, what it is, yeah, is really important. A lot of times people say really important. <laughs> it's like, okay, everything's <laughs> really important. Okay. So can you give me a PN number, a project number? and a project name and maybe like something just a uh, whatever is a trigger <laughs> right. of what right. it is that you're talking about so that I can number one, organize easier and number two. So I know what that email is about, you know, and I can look yeah. at the inbox and select which ones out of, you know, how many that I have that I'm yeah. going to look at first. And that I think is part of time management and organization it's also being considerate of, of your colleagues. Yeah, building on that too. One of the emails I hate to get is, "What is your availability this week?" Seriously, you want me to tell you all mm-hmm. the appointments that I have this week? So, right. because I hate that question, and if 
this isn't an internal question. If it's an internal question, there's almost no excuse because most people are on Outlook or something yeah. like that where you can right. see other people's calendars and you just put something on your calendar, right? I'm fine right. with that. But I also have used for a long time Calendly, which I'll link to in the show notes. You can also use HubSpot, a number of these that have free HubSpot. versions of them. But Calendly allows you to uh, attach your calendar and you can put a Outlook calendar in there. So an exchange email or you can put in like a Gmail calendar, whatever you want. And basically, you just send them a link and you can even put in some questions. Anybody who's ever, you know, applied to be on one of the APN shows, I have Calendly links set up for a number of those. And it asks them their bio, different questions we're going to ask, what subjects, stuff like that. And they see in their own time zone the times that are free for me to actually do that thing. I have Calendly Pro um, because I needed more than the two or three events that you get right off the the free account. And I probably have 30 different things set up. And depending on who I'm talking to, I send them a different link because it has different branding and has different questions. So I check like out that. Calendly or yeah. yeah so with with something like HubSpot, Calendly, it's Calendly. like calendar. Got it. Got it. Without okay. the ER, you put an LY. <laughs> got it. Got it. Now, okay. With something like HubSpot, you can use one of your colleagues and you can put both of your calendars in there and, and send it to a client and say, here, pick something. And that something will be a time frame that is available on both your calendars, which is also a pretty mm -hmm. good thing to do. So, you know, speaking yeah. of calendars, one of the things we do, you know, at the beginning, it was just was at first, you know, we knew all, all of us had it in our mind, you know, what we to be, what was due when. And we had the Excel sheet that had, you know, all the deadlines and everything. But a calendar, a shared calendar is really, really important, especially oh, for yeah. a team. When you're all working yeah. on the same projects, it, to know the hard deadline and not to clutter it, like to have, an, have mm -hmm. an organized approach to what is included on the calendar is important. And then color coding so that you know, you know, just by looking at it, what kind of, you know, jobs are monitoring jobs that are on the calendar, what yeah. is a report that is a deadline, uh, internal deadlines versus external deadlines. Those are all where you can just look at it and your brain can say, can prioritize like immediately. <laughs> and you also know what kind of staff you need to uh, yeah. mobilize for monitoring. And, you know, it's, I, yeah, I, oh, yeah, you're totally right. Calendar is essential to being effective. Yeah, absolutely. So we're basically out of time. So I'm just going to mention a couple more and then I'm going to link to them in the show notes. And if you are a member of the APN, hit me up on the CRM Archaeology Podcast Slack channel for the uh, members only team. And we can talk about this stuff a little more closely. But basically, Trello, and I put Trello for project management, but Trello can be used for lots of different things. In fact, I'm, I'm on a Trello card right now organizing this show and checking off the fact <laughs> that I'm talking about Trello for project management. So uh, it's really handy. I use Trello for lots of different things in my life. Timular for actually keeping track of your time. Again, they have a free version, which is almost fully functional for like 90% of people's needs, but it allows me to create, again, these different types of things to track. And then I can subcategorize those with ats and hashtags and all kinds of stuff. I live and die by Timular. It's the only thing that allows me to know how much time I'm actually spending on stuff, right? I look at how much time do I spend on the average editing the CRM Archaeology podcast versus another podcast? How much time do I spend on this task versus that task? And I can look at those stats across multiple periods of time. And it's just totally invaluable to me. Um, and again, the free version works amazingly. And then just the last thing I'll mention is, like you said earlier in the show, Heather, if there's anything that you can, and I don't want to say delegate just to be a jerk about it, but if there's anything you can give to your people that are working under you or other people on your team, a task that you're doing all the time, it's not that you don't have time for that. It's that you're, you're doing a knowledge share, you're spreading the, the responsibilities out and people feel more included, but it also does yeah. actually take time off of you. And so many people are like, well, this only takes me five minutes, so I'm just going to knock this out. You're doing yourself a bigger disservice by doing that. Even if you don't have the 20 minutes to teach somebody how to do it, take the 20 minutes to teach somebody how to do it because now you don't ever have to do that five minutes again, right? right? Somebody else arrogant, knows that now. I think it's arrogant to not delegate, honestly. Yeah, It's absolutely. you saying, I'm the only one that can do this. That's not true. Yeah, Anybody can do no. it. I mean, you just got to train them yeah. to do it. And it's selfish. They deserve right. the opportunity to grow themselves also. If you're not giving them that opportunity, you're not a good manager. 
Absolutely. And the final thing I'll mention, we didn't have a chance to talk about it, but Stephen put it in the show notes, the Harvard Business Review Guide to Project Management. I actually downloaded the audiobook while we were on this show. So I don't know how good of an audiobook that's going to be, but we'll find out. <laughs> wow, that, that's going to be dry. Um, <laughs> that's going to be dry. I, can, can I have a couple of seconds to just explain it? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. It, it is one of those really short HBR guidebooks that you buy at airports because you can't sleep on a plane. And <laughs> it, it runs through a lot of different uh, systems um, that have been developed for project management and, and kind of breaks it down into concepts. And so mm -hmm. if, you, if you're looking for a really quick, easy read, that's an overview of different ways of doing project management. I've always found it really helpful. Nice. All right. Well, we got it in the notes and uh, we'll go from there. So if anybody has anything they want to contribute, like what, what helps you keep on task, then, you know, comment wherever you see this. Uh, if you put this somewhere where you don't have the podcast, be sure to tag at ArcPodNet and, uh, you know, maybe we can join in on that conversation. So with that, we will say goodbye and we're going to put on our schedule the time to edit this podcast and get it posted <laughs> because that's good project management. I mean, literally every podcast episode is its own project. We have to plan it. We have to schedule it. We have to edit it. We have to post it, do the social medias. It's like micro project management 15 times a week. <laughs> it's just, it's insanity. So with that, again, thanks guys. Thanks for all your insights and we will see you next time. That's it for another episode of the CRM Archaeology Podcast. Links to some of the items mentioned on the show are in the show notes for this podcast, which can be found at www.arcpodnet.com slash podcast. Please comment and share anywhere you see the show. If you'd like us to answer a question on a future episode, email us. Use the contact form on the website or just email chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Support the show and the network at arcpodnet.com slash members. Get some swag and extra content while you're there. Send us show suggestions and interview suggestions. We want this to be a resource for field technicians everywhere, and we want to know what you want to know about. Thanks to everyone for joining me this week. Thanks also to the listeners for tuning in, and we'll see you in the field. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV Traveling America, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Thanks again for listening to this episode and for supporting the Archaeology Podcast Network. If you want these shows to keep going, consider becoming a member for just $7.99 US dollars a month. That's cheaper than a venti quad eggnog latte. Go to archpodnet.com slash members for more info.